Thank you for joining us this evening in our Bible study. We are continuing our study last week in Acts chapter 17. This uh, focuses on Paul's uh, sermon at Mars Hill. And we didn't really get very far last week, and we may not get very far tonight. We are taking, we're just taking this uh, verse by verse and just picking the verses to pieces and getting everything that we can possibly get out of it to help us understand and appreciate uh, what the apostle encountered uh, in his visit to Mars Hill. Remember last week we said that uh, all indications are the apostle visited that city and toured that city for probably three days. And when he said that the city was wholly given to idolatry, it really was. Uh, there was no place you could go that you were not going to uh, see an idol. As we said on a number of occasions, the statement was that it was easier to find an idol than it was a man uh, in Athens, that there was so plentiful, so many of them. And uh, keep in mind also when we talk about idols, we're not talking about just uh, statues that resemble a human being. We're talking about altars, uh, anything, everywhere you went, no matter. You could not escape uh, the presence of idols. And so with that in mind, Father, thank you tonight that we have this time and we have the scripture to uh, awaken our hearts to the realization that idols are just as real in the world in which uh, we live as they were in the day of the apostle. They may take a different shape, a different form, uh, but they are the object of people's worship, and therefore they become an idol. And so tonight, help us to understand and appreciate uh, what the apostle was saying as the Holy Spirit led this scripture to be written in Christ's precious name. Amen. Realize, of course, that uh, in verse 22 it said, Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Uh, the word really is religious, and uh, they certainly were. And we know that uh, religion is all on the outside. Uh, Christianity is on the inside. And so uh, people may appear to be rich, uh, religious, but it's all a show. It's all on the outside. And then in verse 23, he said this, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare unto you. And so if when Paul talked about the unknown God, he wasn't talking about some unknown and the people weren't worshiping uh, a, an unknown God that may have been one of many. Uh, we do know that, as we said, they had a God for everything. They had an idol for every God and a God for everything. Uh, it may be the sun, the rain, the moon, <laughs> uh, whatever it is, their health, uh, anything that you could possibly name, uh, there was an idol uh, that was dedicated to it. And so when uh, they came to realize, though, that there was something going on in the universe that they couldn't explain. <laughs> and so uh, in order that they not offend uh, that God, they created this statue to the unknown God. And it does not mean, by the way, that there was only one statue to the unknown God. And uh, the interesting thing is, uh, it was uh, not known, uh, they may not have known his actual name, they didn't know his power, didn't know anything about his work, but they just knew there was a God out there that they could not explain. 
And so to be sure that they did not offend any God, they put up this statue. And Paul said, let me tell you about this God, but we're not there just yet. And uh, the thing was that they really felt like they knew all of the other gods personally. It didn't matter if it was the God of rain. They had names for them, the God of the sun, the God of the moon, the God of the health, the God of the wealth, you name it. Uh, those gods had names, and they were personal to the people who worshipped them. But this, in this particular case, uh, they simply did not uh, know anything and could not explain uh, the God that, to whom that statue was dedicated. The interesting thing is that it was, as far as the apostle was concerned, it was not important to him why or how <laughs> that altar was erected. Uh, his focus was not on uh, the unknown God. As a matter of fact, he's going to uh, explain to them in no uncertain term that the God that you, don't, that you do not know, the God that you say you do not know, and probably they didn't, uh, can be known. And I'm going to make, do my part to make him known to you. And so this was a matter of what the apostle was saying. There is one God that exists among many. There is one God that exists among all of your little gods. And while the God of whom we speak is spelled with a capital G, you can spell your God with a little g because he's just a little God anyway and not capable of doing anything. And so it's interesting because they apparently... Uh, and this is where we are in the world today. Uh, people may know of God, but they don't know God. And it's just so much evidence out there that uh, it's virtually impossible to dispute. It is virtually impossible to deny uh, the existence of an eternal God. There's somebody in this season of the year is absolutely one of the best times for that to be proven. Look at creation. Look at the new life that's springing forth. Where do you think that's coming from? Who do you think is behind all of that? How does all of that happen? Uh, simply the God that the people did not know. And uh, it's interesting because uh, he's not setting aside uh, and really not spending a lot of attention on the other gods. And he's not trying to trick them that would be a big mistake on the apostles' uh, part. He really is handling this straight up. And uh, it's interesting because, as you all know, like they say about counterfeit money, uh, you don't, uh, the agents don't focus on recognizing counterfeit money. They recognize, focus on recognizing real money. And if you know the real money, then there's no trouble to recognize the counterfeit. And so it's interesting because uh, he's not trying to uh, put up an argument. Uh, he's not spending a lot of time saying, I can't believe you all will be so foolish. I can't believe, let me, you know, how dumb is this? How foolish is this? That you all are talking about some God out there, the sun and the God of the moon, the God of the rain and all this. Paul didn't spend his time with that. He focused on the one that he knew was the absolute true God. And so Paul simply presents the facts. And in that verse, he makes it clear that and they want, he wanted to present the facts and let them realize that all of the other gods uh, that they had been worshiping were fictions. And... It, they were to be cast aside and that forever. Just get, be done with them. And by the way, what the Apostle Paul did was uh, not contrary to Roman law. And so he did what he did and he said what he said within the context of Roman law. And so in verse 24, he said this, 
God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And so Paul simply appealed to the scripture uh, as even some of the pagans saw him. And he wanted to present his argument this way. God is absolutely omnipotent. He is the omnipotent creator. He is the ruler of the universe. He is absolute. He is sufficient. He makes it so men can have a relationship with him. And he wants them to understand that everything is totally dependent on God. Everything and everyone. Everyone and everything is totally dependent on God. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is the Lord of heaven and earth. And so it's interesting because uh, he wanted them again to know this is not one God among many. You've got all your gods out there. You've got hundreds of them. Who knows, maybe even thousands of them. But this God is not in competition with the others. This God, the God that we worship, is the God that stands alone. And he is the God who made the world. And not only did he make the world, but he made everything within the world. God that made all things, he said, he made the world and all things therein. And so it was simply a matter that he made the great, he made the small, he made the visible, he made the invisible. Nothing came into being of itself. And nothing arranged itself. Everything that has life stems from God. Everything that you see in the universe God created it, that simply the world and everything that is in the world. And it was the fact of life that nothing was before God. That it just, what, it just wasn't. Nothing was before God, and it's everything has its origin in God. And Paul wanted to get that abundantly clear. And this statement, by the way, with that one statement, the foundation of idolatry is abolished. It's gone. Because if you believe, and we must, that God was before the foundation of the world, that God spoke and things happened, the world came into being, that he is the creator that there is no such thing as a Big Bang theory, theory, that you know that, you understand that, and that eliminates a lot of the nonsense concerning idol worship. And so it was very clear that he is creator Lord. That's what he is, that's what he does. And he said this, he is the Lord of heaven and earth and dwells not in temples made with hands. That boy was a blow to them because it's interesting, he does not dwell in handmade sanctuaries is the way to word that. And how could the God who created the universe be confined to one little spot. Now, it doesn't matter, and when the temple was built, they made this abundantly clear. God doesn't dwell in the temples. Heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool. footstool. That is absolutely abundantly clear. And so, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, backs that up, by the way. Here's the thing, all sanctuaries, all temples are handmade. 
Uh, that's just the reality of it. That everything was uh, was built somewhere at some time by somebody. And so, not only that, but here's the thing. They were fashioned by human hands. Every temple, every sanctuary, no matter what, every place of worship, as sacred as they may be, were fashioned and built by human hands. And when you look at that, you understand that's great, that's wonderful. But what are all of the temples? What are all of the sanctuaries in comparison to the universe? <laughs> this is what Paul is saying to these people. You want to make a big deal, he said, seeing that the Lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hand. Listen, what is, what is your thinking? And what are they in comparison? God is greater, and not only so, God is creator of the universe. And so you're going to reduce him to something that men made, and you're going to make something fashion it however you want, an idol, an altar, whatever it may be, and you're going to say, that's God. He's going to present another argument a bit later, we'll get to that, but just to uh, give you a little head start and a little advance notice, uh, he is saying that we are the offspring of God. And he said, you can't make an idol or a statue and put it there and say that we are the offspring of that statue. How pathetic is that? How pitiful is that? And so it makes it abundantly clear that what are, the, what are all of these temples, what are all of these places of worship, what is anything in comparison to the universe? And God created the universe this God that you do not know, this God that you by your own admission, by your own inscription to the unknown God, this God is the one I want to tell you, you need to get to know him because he is your creator. He created you. He created the universe. And he created everything within the universe. And so that for the apostle Paul in verse 25 says this, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he, he gave to all life, breath, and all things. So, boy, does he get down to business with this one. He said that he is not worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. By men's hands, it simply means that uh, he served uh, the needs of someone else that was, uh, and God is depending on us to meet these needs. It is simply a matter of uh, a person who is ill obviously would need the services of a physician, and that's understandable. But when the apostle said, he's not worshiped with men's hands, as though he needed anything. And keep this in mind, for people who really believe that they can just somehow appease God through the things that they do, through the things that they give, God doesn't need anything. He really doesn't. It's amazing when we talk about stewardship we have to be very careful because if we don't, we will get into the trap of thinking that God needs what I have to give him. Really? You think the God who created the universe, the God who needed something he could speak and it would come into being, you really think he needs our money. 
Do you really think he needs anything else that we give him? He wants, listen, we are the ones who need to give. We are the ones who need uh, to worship God through the gifts, through the offerings that we uh, afford to him. We do it because we love him. We don't do it because we think God needs it. As a matter of fact, this may humble a lot of people, but God doesn't even need us. He uses us, but he doesn't need us. And I know that I've heard the argument, yes, he does too. Uh, well, it depends on what your angle is. Listen, God has been pleased to use us in his work. So in that sense, yes, he needs us. But keep in mind that the scripture is very clear that if we didn't offer praise to God, he'd raise up stones to do that. And so that in that sense, we need to understand, and this is exactly what the apostles said, he is not worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything because, get this, see, and he is the one who gives to life, breath, and all things. That's simply the case. We don't need, God doesn't need us, but boy, do we ever need him. Because he'll say this too, our life and times are in his hands. It's in him that we live and move and have our being from day to day. And our, it really is uh, a fact that we need to take to heart. Our life and times are in his hands. It's in him that we live and move and have our being from day to day. Our father, my father, and I say ours because of a family, uh, when he prayed, and it was always said that whatever time you got out of church, depending on whether he had to close in prayer or not, but I can now hear my father pray this many times, many times, to the God in whom we live and move and have our being from day to day. I cannot tell you the countless times I heard him. Very seldom I recall that I ever hear him pray that somewhere he was not going to pray that. And the realization is true. In him we live and move and have our being from day to day. And so it is though we who profit from praise. It is we who profit from adoration, from prayer. It is we who profit from worshiping God. We are the ones who profit. And God is honored. God is glorified. But God doesn't need it. We need it. And he, want, he needs it in the sense that he wants it from his people. Uh, and we need it in the sense that our worship, our fellowship with the Lord, is just not complete without it. It really isn't. There's a void in our lives when we're not praising God. It's a void in our lives when we're not worshiping God. It is a void in our lives when we're not praying to God. It is a void. He wants to have the time with us. He wants us to have time with Him. Yeah, he wants us to just sometimes just talk with Him, sometimes just listen to Him, and sometimes just be quiet and just do nothing. Just let the, the presence of the Lord fill your life, fill your heart, fill your mind. And uh, what are the words of the song? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And it, that's exactly what will happen. And so Paul to this church said, to these people said, it not, wasn't a church, uh, seeing he giveth life to all and breath and all things. We share with you tonight in closing the invitation because I don't know how many are listening on Wednesday. I don't know how many are listening on Sunday by Facebook and YouTube. And I don't know of those who do. 
how many are believers and how many are not, how many have fully trusted Christ as their Savior, and how many think that Jesus was a good man, and that's about the extent of it, and he did some good things, and that's about the extent of it, and he did some miracles, and that's about the extent of it, but have never really invited Jesus into the heart. And so I just want to remind you that we are coming very close to the time of recognizing the Savior's death on the cross. We are coming very close to celebrating the time when Jesus Christ came out of that tomb. And if you've never invited Jesus Christ into your heart, this season of the year won't really have the meaning that it should. And I know that churches across the country will have maximum attendance. Let's put it this way. They'll have higher attendance that, than any other time in the year. And that's fine. I'm thankful they come. I'm thankful they come Easter, and I'm thankful they come Christmas. I get to preach twice to them anyway. But it's more than that. It's more than that. It's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about being in the house of the Lord. It's about Jesus being in your heart and you serving him and worshiping him. So for those who are listening by Facebook or YouTube, I'm asking you tonight, give your heart to the Lord. Because unless and until you do, you are worshiping the unknown God. You're putting your faith in something or somebody that you, can only, you don't even know. And somebody who cannot do anything for you. You're putting your trust in the material things of this world. You're putting your faith in the gods of this world. And I can tell you, they will not be there for you when you need them. And so tonight I ask you, give your heart to the Lord. Be done with idol worship. Be done with the unknown God. And the apostle is making it abundantly clear, and I'm trying to follow in his tracks to tell you, you can know our God. You can know our God. And he doesn't need anything from you. He wants you before anything else. And I just admire, appreciate the Apostle Paul saying to, about one church, first of all, they gave themselves to Jesus Christ. Father, thank you tonight for the privilege, the honor, the joy of worshiping the true and living God, of knowing him. And we don't have to spend our days knowing that we've got to depend on somebody and we've got to worship somebody that we do not know, cannot relate to, cannot pray to, does not hear us, uh, is not involved in our lives because our God cares. Our God is real. Our God is alive. And we pray tonight that those who hear the message, hear the invitation, will no longer, not one day, won't no longer worship the Lord that they call and only know as the unknown God. For in truth, he is not God. They are not a Lord. They are idols, plain and simple, start to finish. Thank you, Jesus, for your precious love, your precious gift, and the privilege we have of worshiping you and loving you in Jesus' name. Amen.